my background was in the humanities. I was an English major. When I graduated from um, college, I wanted to be a journalist. Um, I lasted in a uh, in a job as the assistant to the assistant editor of a magazine nobody ever heard of uh, for about three months. And then I got uh, scared um, about my future. And so I decided to take pre-med courses and go to medical school, but it, it, it really all worked out and I loved medicine. Um, and it wasn't, and then a lot of years happened, had three kids, went through training, um, um, husband's a doctor too. Um, uh, and then it wasn't until my 40s. Uh, and I, here I was sort of mid-career primary care physician that I thought, wait a minute, I don't think I'm supposed to be doing something else too. Like not something else completely, but something else too. And what's interesting to me, as I do a lot of mentoring and a lot of talking with young doctors and pre-meds and college students and residents and med students and stuff, and what's really interesting to me is that um, the younger people I've talked to seem to have figured this out a lot earlier. Like I talk to pre-meds who have already decided that being a full-time doctor is not sustainable and they want to know how to add a writing career. It's really interesting. But anyway, it, well, I, it took me till my 40s and I literally started taking night courses, at, you know, adult ed night courses in writing. And I did a lot of that. And then I decided, yeah, I mean, this is all really fun, like writing English papers, you know, as my midlife hobby. Really, this is what it was. Um, but I really want to be a professional writer. I really do. I want to be like that Atul guy. I want to be like that. But I didn't really want to write about the things he was writing about. That wasn't like my jam, like medical error and it, all this kind of stuff. It wasn't really what I was interested in. And I went round and round and round and I would go to bookstores and I would imagine my name on the shelf, like where it would be in the alphabet. And um, but I wasn't getting anywhere with it. Um, and I would think of like some great story that happened in clinic that I wanted to write about, but somehow I never did. And I wasn't getting anywhere with it. And finally, my husband said, after like the 9,000th conversation we had about this, he said, why don't you do what you know how to do, which is go to school? Isn't there a like professional writer school? You could go to that. And that is what I did at the age of 52. I enrolled in an MFA program, what's called a, a low residency MFA. This is for working people. You know, you go twice a year, 10 days at a time. The rest of the time you're, you know, you're doing it all remotely. Um, and I absolutely loved it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of question about whether you can teach someone to write. Um, I'm not sure you can teach someone to write, but you can teach someone how to read their own writing. And, and two years in that program, I got really good at reading my own writing and saying, nah, that didn't work that sentence is terrible. Uh-uh. You're not being honest enough. I got really good at that. And then a bunch of stuff happened and I was essentially a very busy freelancer. I was writing a, a column for the Boston Globe. I was doing essays in the New England Journal, etc., etc., etc. But I had this kind of like, yeah, but I want to write a book. And then I still go into the bookstores. Where's my book going to be on the shelf? I want to write a book. I want to write a book. Um, but it wasn't happening. And, um, and then what happened was, and this is, uh, there's a quote that's attributed to John Lennon. Oh, there's that AI dude. It's creepy. Um, it's attributed to John Lennon, but he apparently didn't actually say this, but it's a good quote, which is life is what happens while you're making other plans. So what happened was, my mother, who I adored, had a massive anterior MI after having what was in retrospect angina for about 18 months, which I did not recognize. To be fair, neither did her doctor. And she presented while visiting me in Boston 
presented to my emergency room with a massive MI. And I thought two things. Oh, and ultimately she actually died of complications of that MI. She had a series of strokes um, and she ultimately died uh, about three or four years later. And I thought two things because writers, and if you're a writer or an artist or a photographer or whatever, you're like a little bit of a sicko because when something happens, your first thought is, oh my God, I'm devastated. And your second thought is, I'm totally writing about this. It is, it is, um, it is both a gift and a sickness. Um, it's kind of like, um, uh, it's kind of like, well, of course you can't talk about having a, a camera with you because we all have cameras with us now, but if you can imagine in the days, hi, Mariam, where are hi. you, That's where are you zooming in from? Uh, right now in Arizona, Arizona. but I live in New Jersey. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, if you can imagine, um, like if you're a photographer or a painter or, um, or even if you're like a social media influencer, like all of a sudden you're seeing the world through that lens. And I had always been someone who saw the world through the lens of stories. Uh, but then when I started writing, I was always looking for stories like the crazy people on the beaches, you know, with the metal detectors looking for the necklaces and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I had a great story. I killed my mother. Like, that's a great story, right? Uh, and so I spent two years writing that story. There was only one problem with it. It wasn't really true. And I kind of knew it wasn't true. So what I ended up doing uh, 500 pages later, unlike medicine, writing is a very, very, very inefficient process. You know what's weird, Tommy, is there are 10 people on the Zoom and they keep disappearing. And it's odd. Is, except and they're, they're coming here. In. I'm only seeing six people. Do we have a, a, including us, is there a setting that's like making people I'm trying to wonder if it's, if I do to one of the, um, anyway. Yeah. Cause I, I know anyway. Patrick, I see joined as well. And Jesse is on, but her camera's off, but, um, yeah. Shabani, yeah, I think weird. Is, okay. Yeah. I'll just keep talking. Anyway. Okay. So, so 500 pages and two years later, um, I thought, oh, um, well, maybe I'm writing the wrong book. Um, maybe what I'm writing is an essay collection about my experience as a woman in medicine, starting from being a kid in the 60s and 70s with a dad who's a doctor, um, all the way to the verge of retirement. And my mother's story would be threaded through it. And that's what I what I ended up with. So I want to just I'm going to do a little screen share thing here. Uh, and um, let's see. Yep. And just oh, you disabled screen sharing. Let me see if I can get it. I think it's um, uh, give me one second here. There we go. You should be able to share it now. Okay. So um, even though this is PowerPoint, it's really going to be pretty painless because really what I want to do here, in addition to sort of telling my story, is to really encourage you to think about telling your stories in whatever form uh, moves you. Uh, so I don't know if cardiologists say this anymore, but when I was in medical school, we were taught that the way you diagnose an MI is you need three things, the EKG, the enzymes, and the story. Does anyone say that anymore, Tommy? Not in those words, but I feel like when I call the intervention now staff. Now it's like you got the troponin and you don't care about anything else, right? Well, no, but I feel like it's really, because oftentimes the enzyme, it's really the EKG and like, what's the story? I think if, What's if the story? Okay. So this was what was said all the time. And um, 
you know, because of the background that I just told you about, you can guess the part that I liked the best. Uh, I was really interested in the story. And um, I just want to sort of go to this moment, uh, this piece of my story. So here I am on the left front row. Um, that was during my chief year at Hopkins. I'm rocking the bad 80s hair and the shoulder pads. Yep. And I also, you can't see them. I had big disc earrings um, and Lancome makeup. Uh, ask your moms about that. Um, anyway, if you had asked me, um, uh, like, what did this moment represent to me? I think one of the things I would have said is that it represented a fork in the road that I had taken. I had been, you know, a, a, an English major. Um, I didn't even particularly like math and science. I held my nose and took organic chemistry to get into medical school. Um, and I thought, well, okay, now I've fully thrown my lot in with the medicine and science people. Uh, I've made my choice. Uh, and I'm not that kind of person anymore. Now I'm going to be this kind of person. Of course, that was completely ridiculous, um, but it took me a long time to figure that out. The ancient Greeks could have told me how ridiculous it was, uh, because for them, the god Apollo was uh, represented both medicine and poetry. These things were entirely aligned. Here's the lyre for poetry, the snake for medicine. Uh, to sort of put it in terms that are more congenial to our modern sensibilities, we have a left brain and a right brain. And even though we sometimes say, oh, I'm like a total left brain type, or, you know, my partner's a total right brain type, um, we know in clinical practice that we need both. I practiced, oh, I forgot the end of my story. So I practiced uh, primary care internal medicine at Mass General for 32 years in the same practice. Um, and um, gradually, I sort of brought my uh, reading and writing interests into the hospital, running uh, workshops, uh, um, coaching writers, uh, running literary events. Um, and um, a few years ago, I created the role of writer in residence, uh, which I now occupy. A year ago, I gave up my practice, and now I do this other work for medical humanities work full time. So anyway, um, um, certainly in primary care practice, and I think in cardiology too, uh, you need your right brain as much as you need your left brain, uh, to say the least. Uh, and, um, you know, part of right brain thinking is storytelling, and we don't need to get into this now, but the, the sort of the science of storytelling, why it is human beings have evolved to think and communicate in stories is really fascinating. We are the only animals who do this. You know, like llamas tell very few stories. And, you know, a, a scientist friend of mine who, who this is his field, he says, spiders swim, uh, sp spiders spin webs, beavers build dams, and people make stories. And if that is what we do, we don't, present, well, I don't know about AI, dude, but we don't think or communicate in data points. If I were to ask anyone here, why are you here this evening? Why did you join Cardio Nerds? Why do you live where you live? What was your relationship like with your parents, etc.? You would tell me a story. You wouldn't even think about it. You would tell me a story. Um, and the elements of story are um, if you were sitting here in front of me, we would do this interactively, but the elements of story, if you know, if you have a recipe for, um, you've got a pot and you're making a story, what are you putting into it? Um, you've got uh, people or animals, if they can talk. Um, you've got like a main person, that's the protagonist. Um, you've got um, a, some sort of passage of time, uh, a beginning, a middle, and an end. That could be one single day uh, spread out over an 800 page novel. James Joyce did that. Um, and um, you have some kind of conflict, like something needs to happen, right? Uh, that needs to get resolved or not get resolved. You have a setting and, and so forth. Um, the passage of time is very important. You cannot have a story 
that doesn't in some form or another have a beginning, a middle, and an end, because the, the, the middle can't happen till the beginning happens and the end can't happen till the middle happens. And once you have sequence, you start thinking in terms of cause and effect. And once you have cause and effect, you start thinking in terms of meaning and even moral. I did not think of this, Aristotle thought of this. So, so um, storytelling has always been, is central to what we do in the hospital and the clinic. When we pick up the phone and say, uh, hey, can I curbside you about this guy? We tell a story. When we present on morning rounds, we tell a story. When we write in the chart, we tell a story. Grand rounds, we tell a story, and actually in a highly ritualized way. And if we deviated from telling the story in that way, I mean, people would look at us like we had two heads. You'd get failed as a medical student if you said, yeah, I have a 50 year old guy and like he smokes and, um, you know, he lives here and, um, you know, one time he was depressed. And I mean, if you presented a case like that as a, as a series of bullets, you would you would be laughed at and justifiably because no one would know what you were talking about. And that would be really bad for the patient's care. Okay. So this is the Edwin Smith papyrus, which um, is the first known medical case history. Um, it's a series uh, that was found by the archaeologist uh, Edwin Smith, goes back to 1600 BCE. If your hieroglyphics are a little rusty as mine are, um, here's, here's a, one of the cases. So um, ignore the overly formal quasi-biblical language. I'll just say it in English. Case number four, if you find someone whose head is split, you uh, make supports with two bricks, so a cervical collar, right? Um, until he's stable. And then here's the interesting part. And you should do then the same for everyone you see who has a split skull. Well, that is how we teach medicine, right? You know, we don't just sort of learn about MIs in general, we do, but then we learn about this person with an MI, which adds to our knowledge that we then apply to the next person and the next person and the next person, and that's what we call clinical experience, right? Now, here's what I want to propose to you, and this is a bit of a stretch, but bear with me on it. Not only is this how doctors think this is also how narrative works think about this why do we read harry potter why do we read anna karenina why do we read the girl with the dragon tattoo because well you know it's entertaining right and we want to know what happens next but there's also a sense we have that this one individual is a is a signifier for other people in general including ourselves so the specific story resonating more broadly is how storytelling works and it's also the way doctors think so when i went to graduate school at the ripe old age of 52, um, I learned about something called the Freitag Pyramid. This is essentially a schema for how plots work uh, and you can, uh, stories, and you can plug any plot you can think of into this. Let's try Cinderella. Exposition, that's where we meet the main character, Cinderella, her mother died, father marries, horrible woman, mean stepsisters. That's the setup. We've met Cinderella. Then there's a rising action. Some stuff happens. There's going to be a ball. Cinderella can't go. Then there's a climax. 12 o'clock. Then some other stuff happens. Loses the glass slipper. Glass slipper fits. 
And then there's a denouement, marries the prince happily ever after. When I first saw this, I thought, hmm, something about this looks very, very familiar to me. And I realized that that was because I had been doing it my entire professional life. Exposition, well, we call it the chief concern now, right? So, um, which I think is ever so much nicer. Um, exposition, we meet the patient, the protagonist. This is the 55-year-old man with chest pain. There's a little backstory and some stuff that happens. Climax shows up in your emergency room. Bunch of more stuff happens. Gather data. Maybe there's a complication. And then there's a resolution. Admit to CCU. Or send home with a GI referral. It's essentially a classic narrative. Okay, so surprise, surprise, there have been a lot more doctor writers than there have been engineer writers or um, bus driver writers or carpenter writers um, or lawyer writers. Why? Um, because this is what we do, right? Um, and William Carlos Williams, one of my favorite the great modernist poet, he had a general practice in um, uh, in Rutherford, New Jersey, uh, his front stoop was his waiting room. He wrote poems, some of the greatest of the um, of the 20th century on his prescription pad. You probably memorized one of them in middle school. It's called an apology. I ate the plums that were that you were saving for breakfast. They were so sweet and so cold. Um, the origin of that poem, by the way, was his wife was his nurse, of course, she wasn't really a nurse. Um, and he was always going out on house calls and delivering babies in the middle of the night. And she would, you know, she would leave a note for him. Uh, you know, uh, Bill, your dinner is in the is in the icebox, which is what they called it then. Uh, and, uh, you know, heated up at, you know, 300 degrees or whatever. Um, and one time he came home from a house call and uh, he ate the plums that she was probably saving for breakfast. They were so sweet and so cold. Uh, and he wrote one of the most famous poems of the 20th century. Uh, so just for grins, I started listing all the doctor writers I could think of. I, this is a very partial list in mostly in chronological order. Um, and then I started listing some of the really young doctor writers that I like, um, many of whom I've had the pleasure of working with. Uh, these are all folks in their 30s, maybe early 40s. Uh, and I noticed something, which is that this list is getting much less male, much less white, um, much less straight, um, and uh, much more diverse. Uh, so if you feel like, eh, you know, there's no room for me, um, there's room, for, not only room for you, there's a need for your voice. So if it's like, you know, such a gimme that we should all be writing and telling stories. Why don't we do it? Number of reasons. One, we're perfectionists and we hate looking bad and we hate being wrong about anything because throughout our medical training, we've been told that if we're wrong about anything ever, we're losers. Uh, and that's really not great for artistic expression where you have to like, you know, spend two years writing the wrong book and, and throw out 500 pages. That's more representative of how the writing process goes and that certainly isn't something anyone ever encouraged me to do in medical school or in practice um you know we're here for the patients especially like we're writing our own opinions we're writing about ourselves oh so so self-indulgent um women i find particularly have a problem with this like who cares about my story yeah, yeah you know um, uh, uh we're concerned about patient confidentiality that is a really legitimate concern except that when I coach um, healthcare's, uh, healthcare workers who are writing, I find more often than not, when they start worrying about um, patient confidentiality, uh, it's really resistance to the writing and um, they've gotten sort of too close to something that they don't want to write about, um, which the bad news is, is there's, if there's something you really don't want to write about, it is probably the thing you should be writing about. Um, we worry, oh, if I reveal anything about myself, it's so unprofessional, and then what will my pr 
program director thinking I won't match anywhere and, and my mother will be mad at me. Um, uh, I write very, very personally. None of those things have happened. Uh, and um, I think the reason for that, and you sort of know this from your own experience as a reader, is that when we read something that is self-revelatory, we don't think, man, that person's a loser. We think, oh, I, I relate to that. In other, or, or I don't relate to that. We don't think about that person. We think about ourselves. That's just human nature. Um, we've been told so much that anecdotal medicine, individual stories are not legitimate, that everything needs to be evidence-based. Um, uh, I actually don't think that's true, and I and I don't um, I don't think that um, anecdotal medicine should be a dirty uh, word. And we also fear that oh, I mean, the world is such a mess. Our little story, our little opinions are so small compared to the mess that medicine is in, the mess the world is in. Um, you know, what do we have to say about all of that? So just like there are medical specialties, there are medical writing subspecialties, and these overlap and you can do more than one, unlike in medical specialties, can write in more of an editorial mode, educational mode, personal mode. Um, and that's, that's what I do. So, so sort of going to my book, I want to tell you about um, the genesis of the book, because um, in, included in that is the best writing tip I know which I will share with you. Um, and it's something I tell myself, remind myself of all the time, which is if you think about writing, maybe you think, oh, I know, I wanna write about being a first gen medical student, or I wanna write about my troubled relationship with my family, or I wanna write about the impact of climate change on health. It's a non-starter. These are these things are too big. It's really hard to find the story in those things. Even yeah, you know, I had this interaction with this patient, and it just I can't get it out of my mind. I need to write about it. Even that might be too big. What I would suggest instead is looking for what I call the unstable moment. And what I mean by that is those little moments when you think, huh, why do we do this this way? That makes no sense. Or why am I moved by this? Or why do I think this is funny and no one else thinks it's funny? Or why does this bother me so much? And then just write everything you can think of about whatever it is, and the story will start to emerge. And that's what happened to me. Um, so, so I was in the middle of writing this memoir about how I killed my mother. Uh, and um, uh, I did what writers often do, which is when a project is going badly, you cheat on that project by writing something else. And here's what I think people who write academic papers do this too. Um, so, so here's what happened. Um, it was uh, late June of 2016, and I was asked to participate in uh, an intern orientation exercise for uh, medical interns at Mass General. And the exercise was write a letter to your future self. And then the letters were all collected and they were sealed. And six months later, they're gonna take everybody in a bus to Cape Cod and have a nice retreat for the weekend and hand them back their letters. And they were gonna say, oh, look how far I've come in six months. And um, I was kind of annoyed about the whole thing for a number of reasons. One, I was asked to do it at the last minute uh, and I had to change some vacation plans. Two, I, I run workshops generally um, and I, I was asked to assist in this one. And so I, I sort of didn't like the idea of assisting, particularly I didn't like the idea of assisting a man. Um, I mean, I'm just putting it out there for you. Uh, and then also I thought this whole exercise sounded really hokey. So I'm sitting there like with a very bad attitude, having like total inner eye roll. And then something happened. I look around the table. I notice that more than half of the interns are women. I notice that even though it's late June and it's hot, 
Some of them are wearing their brand new Patagonia fleeces. And I, I, I found myself almost in tears. And I thought, what is that? What is that? Why do I feel that way? And then I had been writing long enough at this point to know that that was writing gold. Uh, and so I wrote, I thought, oh, you know, isn't that interesting? It's 30 years almost to the day since I was starting my internship. What would I want to tell that person? And I thought, and I didn't know the answer. And that's really important. You don't want to know the answer when you sit down to write. If you sit down and write, oh, you know, I was so moved by this patient and I was so compassionate to them and they were so grateful. It's not going to be any good. That's not what a story is. You know, that's a love letter to yourself. I mean, no offense, but we've all done it. And, and doctors especially. I didn't know the answer and the conflict of the personal essay is, is the reader is watching the writer figure out what the heck they're trying to say. So I wrote and I wrote and I thought, oh, okay, I think I'm going to tell my 30 years ago self two things. Number one, bad news, 30 years later, um, we still don't have gender equity in medicine, not by a long shot. And there were some nice statistics in that. And then number two was a little more personal. It was like, hey, you know what? Maybe don't spend the next 25 years or so worrying that you're an imposter and that you probably never should have gotten into medical school and you probably never should have been, you know, on the faculty at Harvard and you probably, you know, and it's only a matter of time before everybody figures out that you actually don't know anything. I mean, like, maybe don't waste your life thinking that way. And, um, and it was published in the New England Journal a few months later. And I thought it would be, you know, of interest to a few young female physicians. And it has been hit as of recently, um, like over 300,000 times. And I get mail about it still, and not just from female people, young people, or physician people. It sort of seemed to hit at something very elemental. Um, and, and the truth of the matter is that if you are really telling the truth, about yourself and you don't have to write personally it can be a true opinion a true advocacy um then that's a big enough story the uh nobel uh, laureate in literature last year the french writer annie ernaud has my new favorite quote it's very simple she says there is no such thing as a lesser truth if it's true for you it will be true for others um and that ultimately led to the book. Uh, and now I just want to um, sort of tell you a little bit about my mother's case, or rather the narrative of my mother's case. So this my wonderful parents um, uh, at my wedding um, 42 years ago. Uh, and my mother had some risk factors, um, Though she was 10 years younger than my father, my father was a, an obese smoker. She was always waiting for him to drop dead of a heart attack. She didn't think she was the type, but then a lot of women don't, right? Um, and uh, in the 80s, she, this is a little sort of cardiology nerd history for you. In the 80s, every woman on the planet was told that she had mitral valve prolapse. And that there was an association between mitral valve prolapse and anxiety. It turns out that's been completely debunked. It also turns out, in my mother's case, as echocardiography evolved over the following decades, uh, that when she finally did have her MI and, of course, had several echoes, she didn't have mitral valve prolapse. And yet, she spent the last 30 years of her life thinking that she was a heart patient, that she was anxious, and she had a little pill box with her, with her Verapamil, you know, and her Radvan, uh, you know, that, that this was sort of part of her identity. It was all just a sort of cultural confabulation. 
which happens in medicine more often than we like to think. This was the timeline. It's kind of a busy slide, and I hate when people say that. So, like, why are you showing me this busy slide? But I'll summarize. So um, uh, she went to law school when she was 41, uh, which was kind of a big deal uh, in 1970. Uh, and um, and uh, she had a short but kind of power packed career. Uh, and she retired and then she could really got into playing tennis and then her doubles partners started telling her that they didn't want to play with her anymore because she never ran to the baseline. Uh, and um, she said that, you know, her left shoulder really bothered her. Uh, she had a rotator cuff issue um, and she was going to physical therapy for that. Um, and then my father died in 2004 and she thought, well, you know, I've been a caregiver for 10 years. Now I'm really going to spread my wings. But within six months, um, she was extremely fatigued. She was diagnosed, she had been diagnosed with CLL. It had now morphed into lymphoma. Uh, she had her first round of chemotherapy. I brought her up to Boston to get that. She was living in my house. Uh, she kept complaining of um, anxiety when she tried to lie down. That rotator cuff on the left was really kicking up. You know where this story is heading. Um, and, um, and this evolved over several days. And then I brought her to the emergency room where she had a massive um, anterior MI. So in the aftermath of this, I did uh, what every um, good clinician uh, and also what every guilty daughter does, which is I did a differential diagnosis of my misdiagnosis. How could I, a veteran practitioner of women's health, have missed what was happening under my own um, and under my own eyes, under my own roof? Um, well, I thought, okay, you know, cardiology was never my best subject. Maybe that's what it is. I'm a little kind of more of a hormones kind of a gal than a anatomy kind of a gal. And I thought, nah, that's not true because I've been diagnosing heart disease in my patients for 30 years. So it's probably not that. Ah, I, I, I made hay on this one. She was a woman. She had atypical. Oh, by the way, her rotator cuff pain uh, went away when she infarcted. But you guessed that. She was a woman. And you, we all know that women have atypical symptoms uh, of their ischemia, right? Oh, plus she was also, you know, she was sort of subsumed her own health to care for my father um, uh, and so forth. Uh, well, it turns out she actually had, uh, had a very typical, um, uh, you know, uh, CAD. Uh, she had near 100% occlusion of her LAD. Uh, she was, as I, I say, she was a widow who had a widow maker. Um, uh, there was actually nothing at all atypical about her anatomy, um, perhaps uh, atypical presentation, but she did not have, um, you know, sub, you know, subendocardial disease or, or, or anything like that. She had a stenosed uh, LAD. Well, maybe I missed it because she was my mother. And the truth of the matter is you're really not supposed to take care of your relatives and for good reasons. And I had always been pretty good about that. Like I never looked in my kids' ears and I never prescribed them antibiotics and, um, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but still, gee whiz, right? And then what I concluded is I wrote more and more about it is I'm going back to where we started. Remember the EKG, uh, the enzymes and the story. This just was not what was supposed to happen to her. She was on a very particular trajectory, new widow, fatigued, had been a caregiver for 10, 20 years, um, had a cancer diagnosis. Um, this just wasn't in her, um, in her thinking. Uh, and it wasn't in her doctor's thinking, and therefore it wasn't in my thinking. Um, 
so there we are um, uh, a few months um, before she died. And I just want to read you very briefly from uh, this part of the book, because uh, even after I had seen her calf, I had seen her calf, I was still in some denial about what had happened to her. That story refused to budge. In the weeks and months after my mother's heart attack, I found it hard to believe that it had actually happened. I struggled to make it real for myself. I recalled articles I'd read about the high incidence of myocardial infarction among those who care for chronically ill family members and among new widows. I reminded myself of my mother's diet, the decades of Philadelphia cream cheese in silver packages with blue writing, cheese omelets and BLTs, hamburgers and steaks and prime rib and liver topped with bacon, and my mother's favorite tongue sandwiches with Swiss cheese and Russian dressing. I pictured the cloud of smoke from my father's cigarettes that had enveloped my mother for decades. Why wouldn't she have had a heart attack? And then I consult an old residency mate of mine who has become a, um, a star in the world of calf. And I reviewed uh, her, um, her calf diagram with him. Uh, it showed the blockage in her left anterior descending artery, the widow maker, and a number of smaller blockages. I contacted Dennis, who'd been a year behind me in residency and who'd become one of the foremost authorities in the world on cardiac catheterization. I emailed him a copy of the diagram and over the phone, Dennis reviewed it with me patiently. I interrupted him several times to ask whether my mother may have had an atypical form of coronary disease, one that might easily have gone undetected for months and more likely to be seen in a woman perhaps. He said she did not. Finally, I just came right out with it. Dennis, I asked, did I kill my mother? He laughed, then he said, wait, what? As if he hadn't heard me correctly. Did you kill your mother? I told him about the months of fatigue and the left shoulder pain and her persistent cough and the day she lived in my house, complaining of how short of breath she became when she lay flat and Dennis said, no, geez, come on. She was old and sick and she had coronary atherosclerosis, the most common cause of death in the world. He made it sound as if I blamed myself for the sun going down. When someone you love suffers, you have failed to protect them. This may seem irrational and unfair, but in the largest sense, it's true. And if you have medical training and you don't prevent someone you love from becoming ill and dying, you feel an even greater sense of failure. Why couldn't I do for my mother what I'd done for other people's mothers? Why couldn't I have done better for her? So I will stop there. That's a mouthful. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about storytelling, writing, etc. Yeah, Dr. Coven, that was fantastic. And I think just that I think what you've demonstrated there really is just the power of stories to not only allow us to reconcile with like the work that we do and to like recon, recon, uh, reframe the work that we do as, as, as providers, as residents, as whatever. Um, but also to like understand, I think. I, I, I also wonder just when patients see themselves reflected in these stories too. And I, I, I think of what you, the diagram you brought of like the narrative, like the rising action and the and then the climax and the, and the conclusion. And I also think about that, you know, when I saw that picture, what I thought of is like the disease progression almost is like, you know, if someone who has AS who has aerosinosis and then they have, they have, as you say, the, the, the context for disease and then they have symptoms that arise and they often present dramatically and then the resolution from their standpoint is they have a valve replacement um, or, or something, or if they can't, then they, it's a palliative situation. Um, 
but I also wonder how how does the narrative seeing seeing stories as the way that you see your work as a physician how does that inform the way that you think patients um, see themselves under your care or saw themselves under your care and I guess how does that work um, well let's just stop with that before I get ahead of myself do you, do you have any you, thoughts on that you, you just pitched that right right like gave me a <laughs> fastball right down the pike I'll tell you there what. we go I've been thinking about this a lot recently as a patient. Mm -hmm. So long story short, um, I was supposed to give up my practice on September 30th, uh, a year ago tomorrow, uh, a year ago Saturday. On October, on uh, September 30th, uh, on September 26th, four days earlier, um, I tumbled down four steps at home rushing uh, downstairs to get paper plates to serve desserts for Rosh Hashanah lunch because I didn't want to wash any more dishes. I have lived in this house 32 years. I have never fallen down those stairs. I had a foosh, a fell on outstretched hand, and I completely shattered my wrist. I, had, I never went back to the practice. Um, uh, and um, I had... Uh, I had surgery uh, three days later, and then I had a extremely complicated um, recovery, which of course I'm writing about because as I've said, like when bad stuff happens, at least it's material. Um, I, I don't know if you know about, um, it used to be called RSD, um, it's now called CRPS. Basically after a trauma, your brain decides to start neglecting your limb like you got into a lot of trouble and i don't know you anymore and you forget how to use in my case my right hand so it was a and it's very painful it was a very um long road not to cure but to healing so it's I will and my right hand will will never be normal again. It's not terrible. I can write. I can open a pickle jar, but it's not normal. And I've been thinking recently about what do I mean by I'm healed but I'm not cured? Because of course we see this among our patients all the time, right? We see people getting healed on their deathbeds, and I think part of what that means, a way to think of what that means, is that I have found a resolution of the narrative. During the weeks that I was suspended in, am I ever gonna get out of pain? Is it ever gonna get any better? <laughs> Why did that doctor say that? <laughs> I was still here. And now I'm here. It is what it is. So, so I do think patients uh, think in terms of narrative, in terms of their own stories. The other thing I would say related to that, Tommy, is that um, if you ever wanna see a patient's face light up, especially if they've seen a lot of different consultants, which is like everybody now, right? Sit back in your chair, turn away from your computer and say, just tell me the whole story. Begin where you wanna begin and just tell me the whole story. Now, I know like when I say that you think, oh my God, I will be sleeping in clinic that night. But here's what's really interesting is that isn't what happens. It actually goes faster. And the reason it goes faster is that here is what the corporatization and digitization of medicine has done to us. It's pitted us against our patients. <clears throat> and one of the ways in which this, this looks is we get this sh cycle of shame, anxiety, and anger. Here's the way it looks. The patient senses that you don't wanna hear their story because you're in a rush, even if you're a nice doctor. That makes them feel kind of anxious which makes them a little more digressive. 
and maybe even a little more somatic, which makes you anxious and kind of pisses you off. And they know that, which makes them anxious and makes them ashamed for having wasted your time, which makes you feel ashamed because like you're just a bad doctor. And, you know, what should be this sort of beautiful, sacred, mutual endeavor becomes like it's this zero sum game. Um, we both can't be happy. And actually neither of us is happy very often. So when you say to somebody, hey, you know, what's this been like for you? Tell me the whole story from the beginning. They relax. They tell a shorter version of the story than they would have in my experience. You relax. And you sort of unplug that cycle. Give it a try. See, see what you think. And it's all about the storytelling. I love that because I, I, I think it also it gives patients an opportunity to say what's important to them in their story, and it's it's you know I think we're taught like you know you're you're taught from the first steps like open ended questions when you interview, and I think the further you get along, the for when as you specialize in in a clinical way, you kind of specialize in the information you want to hear, and you move further and further away from kind of the way that you were taught how to do things in the way that you know allows patients a chance to kind of control their narrative um so i i love that as an approach and it's fantastic right i mean you know the study that we interrupt patients within 11 seconds of when they start yeah. talking that's famous um and then the other thing is we make fun of medical students for how ridiculously complete their histories are oh ha 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 they asked about whether they have parakeets <laughs> I mean, all right, so the parakeets may not be that important. <laughs> but, you know, and or you see a social history, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, you know, has sex with men. That's the social history. Like, that's it? That's who this person is? Doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, has sex with men? I mean, come on, do, do better. Yeah. Um, any other um, any other thoughts, questions about writing, publishing, narrative, et cetera? Yeah. Oh, Dr. Coven, yes. sorry. So when when you write a narrative and you send in like to a, like a well-known journal like New England, then how is the process? Is it is it the same as other papers like they got major revision? minor revisions like something like this or like it's right away to accept it or like reject it the latter so um so to take the new england journal as an example so um beginning oh, about um 10 12 years ago they started publishing personal essays by doctors and medical students um and um and some of them like mine are are quite personal uh, some of them a little bit more perspective -y. um and um uh the um uh if they're going to get rejected they get rejected fast and they're if they're accepted the revisions they're not peer reviewed i mean they're uh, they're read by multiple editors but they don't like I mean, what expert are they going to send letter to a young female physician out to, you know, to fact check it? I mean, it's my life. I know that's what happened. You know, trust me. Um, uh, um, but just as a so if this interests you, so these are twelve hundred words, um, and um, when I've asked the ed the editor, tells me they get a lot of submissions which sounds discouraging, but it's not discouraging because they say they get a lot of submissions, but most of them aren't very good. And so I've asked the editor, when they're not good, what makes them not good? And she said something really interesting, which I'll pass along to you. She said, they're either points without stories or stories without points. 
Right, so that gets back to what we were saying a little bit about storytelling in the beginning. So a point without a story is like there's no question, there's no conflict. It's just, you know, um, you know, uh, health disparities are bad. They make me sad. The end. That's a point without a story. A story without a point is, you know, I saw this patient and like I was so compassionate and they were so grateful and I'll never forget this patient. The patient was so wonderful. That's a story without a point. So how do you get from the story to the point? Well, that'll be enough. That would be another hour. But here's what here's 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 the short answer. I wrote, actually wrote a um, uh, an essay about this in the Lancet. Uh, it's called "What's the Story," and it's a recipe for how clinicians can turn clinical uh, cases into into stories. Four step recipe. But here's basically how it starts: is let's suppose you had like some interaction with a patient some like situation and man you you that is just stuck in your craw it happened five years ago you cannot get it out of your mind um you're not even exactly sure why but it just it just is in your mind of all the patients why do you remember that one that's the one you remember okay good that's a really good starting point then here's what you do next step two you write down everything you can remember about your interaction with that patient what people wore what was on the tray when you walked into the room what family members were there who they reminded you of what they said you know what the case was everything like you're going for a 1200 word essay you write 10,000 words nobody wants to hear that but that is the way it works and then you look at it and you go oh what is this about and then you say what is this really about no 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 what is this really 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 about and it's kind of like it's very similar if you've ever been in therapy which I highly recommend to everybody. It's kind of like when you say something like really smart to your therapist and like, oh, you know, I totally think this is because of this. Except, you know, it's like really glib and superficial. You know, it's not. I mean, it's like true, but it's not, it's not anything, right? When you hit pay dirt, you know it. It's like, it's like watching that, you know, it's like you're making a, a campfire with wet twigs and then all of a sudden, and you know, that's what it is about. And what it is about ends up surprising you. So the way the visual that's very useful that um, the writer Anne Lamott uses in her wonderful book, Bird by Bird, which is a, a really sort of funny writing guide, is she, she calls it Polaroids. You know what Polaroids are? I think they've sort of made a comeback at weddings and stuff. So let's suppose I like to take my Polaroid and I'm gonna take a picture of Ronaldo and he's got like, got some panel in there and he's got some glasses and making a peace sign. And I go, okay, shh, shh. And then I put it on the table and it's like got all the smelly stuff and stuff. Um, and, um, and then finally the image comes up and I was like, wait, holy shit, I didn't, Chelsea's there. I didn't even see Chelsea and Chelsea and she's got like a poop thing on her shelf. That all due respect to Ronaldo is much more interesting than what I thought I was looking at. So what happens if you give yourself the freedom to be a little inefficient and write and write is you get in your head that, oh, this patient interaction was really important. And then like five page pages later, you're talking about your Aunt Sadie. 
And when you sort of drift naturally into that zone, you're probably getting closer to what it's about. It's really like sort of tapping into your unconscious. And this works, by the way, this isn't just for personal writing, for essays like I do. This is for op-eds. Um, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, even for uh, you know, just general narrative nonfiction, you're always asking yourself, what is the deepest truth of what I am writing about? And it's really hard for us because we don't like to look bad. Um, and, um, and, um, and we don't like to look imperfect. So I'll just leave you with this. What happens to uh, folks like us who want to write is here's what happens. We have this just wealth of material, right? I mean, much more than like people who work at Bank of America. And we, um, we say, oh man, this is such a great story. <gasps> and then we go, tch, 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 tch. and then we look at what's on the page and we're like, this sucks. This is so bad. I am really bad at this. I thought I was going to be good at this, but I'm bad at this. <sighs> but the truth is that um, that all first drafts are bad, almost without exception. And if you really want to write, the way to move from the bad first draft to the published piece or the book is you start sharing your bad drafts. And that is so hard for us because when in medical school or residency, were you ever encouraged to show your less than perfect self? Never, never, never happens. It's not part of our culture, but it's necessary for writing. So, um, so how do you share your less than perfect drafts? You take a course, you, um, and courses are really good for deadlines because people like us are really good at deadlines. Um, and, um, uh, or you show your partner, um, or, um, or you join a writing group or whatever. Um, and that's how you move forward. And then when you share your work, here's what happens. In that moment, when you've shared your work, but you haven't gotten the feedback yet, I'm just telling you about this in advance because this happens to everybody. You have a dual fantasy. On the one hand, you think that your writing teacher or your partner or, um, or your whatever is gonna say, this is amazing. This is so like we should just should send it right to the New Yorker. Do not pass go. On the other hand, you think that what they're actually going to say is, this is horrible. You have no talent. You have wasted the minutes I spent reading this. In fact, they will say neither if they are a good reader. What they will say is, you know, over here on page three, I think you're really kind of getting at something. And then you'll start over again. But this is not part of our culture. We're like either, you're either a star or a loser in our culture. When that's not actually not even true either, is it, right? I mean, we're all kind of like, you know, we've got something going on on page three, <laughs> you know, and then need to try harder. Um, but what we tell ourselves is that we're either stars or losers, um, you know, gunners or wimps, et cetera, et cetera. And that culture, by the way, I've spent a lot of time talking to young doctors and doctors in training. That culture has, has changed very little since I started medical school 40 years ago. Astonishingly little. And um, I want to be respectful of your time, and it's 8.15, so I'll end there. No, that's fantastic, and that's, uh, I think, a great note to end on, Dr. Goldman. And thank you so, so much for just taking the time to 
share your experience and your wisdom and just I, I I think this is so refreshing um in so many ways from from clinical work and not because it's not clinical work it's deeply tied to clinical work but it's just a a, a perspective that we that I can speak personally that I I, I I think I lose sight of sometimes but it's it ties back to so many reasons for why medicine is exciting is the ability to live narrative and communicate narrative and um, I'm glad you said that because yeah. one of my pet peeves is when medical humanities get sort of parked in wellness programs. Mm -hmm. You know, like, well, there's narrative and then there's soul cycle. I mean, <laughs> this, this, this isn't like stress relief. This is medicine. Yeah. This is, this is, this is what our patients want from us most. Take that AI guy. <laughs> <laughs> what a note to end on. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Well, All right, I'll stop you the nerds. Recording here. Carry but, on. Um, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. I want to see you writing. <laughs>